Does anyone remember these books? If you're a child of the 80s or even the 90s, honestly, like I am, you're gonna have a moment of nostalgia right now. It was like being inside your own video game before this was a thing. So friends, we're gonna do our own version of Choose Your Own watercolor adventure today and i'm pretty stoked about it and if you like this enough it might even become a series okay so did you ever get to a point in your art and you're just like i really like this but it's not done and if i finish it i might mess it up and i don't know what to do and i really don't want to mess it up so i do nothing or you're like i'm bored with my art style and i need to figure out a new way to bring sassy back to my art yeah so today I'm showing you three, yes, three ways to finish one painting. And while I really hope you watch all three options, you can choose your own watercolor adventure, my friends. Now, before we get to all the choose your own adventuring part of this video, we have to create the original painting. And friends, I've been inspired by toadstools, mushrooms, whatever you wanna call them lately, been painting a ton of them. And so I thought how cool to just continue my obsession and share with you all. So that's what we're up to today. It's all about mushrooms, baby. I'm starting with a wet on dry technique and my half inch dagger brush. You can use around number six. It'll work beautifully. And you're creating these little caps. And friends, I want you to be really experimental with color if you're feeling like it. And then as soon as you have your cap kind of sketched out with the tip of your brush, I want you to sketch out the stem. So my stems are typically cool shades of brown with oranges mixed in and all the things. But at this point, we're going basic. It's about creating those basic shapes. And I'm just gonna rough in the basic values that I want. And no, I'm not going realistic here, friends, but you know, there is something to be said for figuring out where your light source is coming from loosely and trying to capture that. Moving on to some other fun caps, switch up your shapes. So I'm thinking, you know, I don't know all the names of the mushrooms. I really need to figure that out, but I'm gonna call these the little skinny, tall and skinny caps, right? Going with some really fun red, and this is all wet on dry. I'm just going right onto the dry paper with wet color. And I'm adding different colors. So once I lay down a pink, I might float in some red wet on wet, right? A little bit of brown wet on wet. And I just keep filling the spaces with these different caps at different sizes, different scale. Sometimes I'm clustering a section of a certain shape of mushroom together, but scaled down and a bit smaller. And then I have these bigger like button type mushrooms that are taking up way more space than everything else and are becoming kind of focal points. I definitely envision this painting bright, kind of balanced subtly with muddy tones. So I go in often right at the beginning of the shape of a particular mushroom with really bold color. And then I might get a little more lackadaisical about rinsing my brush, but by design to float in some softer or more muted tones so things don't get too psychedelic yet. And yes, that was a little bit of creative foreshadowing, my friends. So you're gonna have to stick around to understand why. And let me tell you, you're gonna wanna stick around. Don't be afraid to switch up your brush. As you're working, you're gonna be going from big shapes to medium shapes. And then as I am right here, these stems are super dupe skinny. So change up your brush. I'm using a number two round so that you have the control you need. And that's the thing. Once you wrap your head around the brushes you use most, and for me, let's just say for me, it's a dagger, a round brush, a smaller round brush, two, four, somewhere in there, and a liner brush. Once you really have become the master of your favorite brushes, you're gonna start grabbing for them instinctively. You're gonna feel that little tug in your creative soul that says, this brush just doesn't feel right. It, it feels like it's making my job harder. But until you get that instinct build up, friends, it's all about you're painting smaller skinnier shapes you want a smaller skinnier brush and the opposite is true and I don't mean to talk down I know it may seem obvious but when you're a beginner 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 
nothing is obvious. Everything feels crazy. So hopefully that's helpful. Don't be afraid in this particular style of letting these shapes bump up to one another. I love swatching colors, repetitive shapes, where you bump the shapes up next to one another to see how the colors explode into each other. I'm gonna link to some of those videos down in the information section, but friends, that's my point here. You can take that practice of letting shapes purposely and slightly bump up next to one another in your paintings. Like look at that blue that's traveling into that chartreuse uh, mushroom cap. Look how fun that is. And I'm not trying to stop that, right? I think it's pretty darn cool. That, my friends, is a beautiful, happy accident. Go with it. All right, I gotta tell you what, the community here is stellar. Y'all are so smart and have the best ideas. So head into comments now after you give this video a boop, that's a like, and tell me how you're feeling about these pre-psychedelic uh, mushrooms I got going on here. Are you excited? Are you feeling a little like, what is Christy doing? Like, let's just have the conversation, head on down. Remember the tip of your brush, whether you're using a dagger or a round brush, the very tip of it with the right amount of light pressure, it acts very much like a soft nib pen or even a pencil would. And what do I mean? You can sketch with it. So when you're first roughing in your shapes or sketching in your shapes, think about the tip of your brush and just laying down linear lines and shapes that you can then quickly follow up and fill with your full bold color. Here I go again with a really varying the scale. I've got these little tiny downward drooping blooms. And so yes, I am putting in a few kind of loopy doopy, flowers in here that really aren't anything in particular, but just a fun way to add a little bit of tiny scale clusters into the mix. Don't be afraid of adding more fine detail while you're still establishing your composition. It, for me, it's good for the soul. It's good to keep you motivated to see that, that fine detail really progress and evolve the painting quickly. So I know the rules say to add the details at the end and build up slowly, but pff, heck with the rules, do what feels good and this feels good. Remember friends, we are going to get this painting to a certain point, about two thirds complete. And then I'm going to show you three different ways to finish this painting. Because friends, I know, I know you get stuck in ruts. Even if you are a um, moderate beginner, beginner, moderate, whatever you want to call it, you've been painting for a little while, it can feel overwhelming. You feel like you get in the same rhythm, the same groove, and you're kind of tired. Well, today is going to shake you right out of that because these three ideas are probably going to be done in a way that you would never think but in a way that you're gonna get really excited to try. Just continuing on through this composition, a few things that I'm thinking about as I go, and as you can see, I'm getting deep, deep into the details here, bringing in some strong like indigo blues mixed with browns to get that really dark, rich color, adding some shading underneath the cap of the mushroom, all the while, I've got tons of blank area on my page and unfinished areas, but it's okay, it's okay. So a couple of things that I think about in terms of composition at this point, just a really fast and loose lesson on composition. So think about scale, think about negative space, think about direction. So scale, you don't want everything to be the same size. You wanna have some really small clustery, textury things, and you wanna have some big bold moments with big swaths of color, and then you wanna have an in-between. So right now, my big bold swaths of color are the red-capped mushroom, and then secondary, the blue-capped mushroom, right? My middle of the road, medium size scale items are those tall and skinny cap mushrooms that are clustered together and have those cool wavy stems that kind of meet at a point at the bottom right. And then my tiny, tiny scale at this point are those little fluffy downward droopy loopy flowers, right? Okay, so as we continue on the composition, we just wanna keep the direction of everything 
kind of interesting. We don't want all the clusters and all the big mushrooms and all the loopy doopy flowers heading in the same direction. But at the same time, we don't want there to be all different directions. Every element be facing a different way because that could be just kind of like way too trippy. Fast forwarding a bit so you can see how the composition is evolving. I took those loopy doopy flowers and I love the idea of like a waterfall of flowers. It's at a slight curve. It's, it's almost right in the middle of the painting, which is a compositional nightmare, but I actually like it. I'm making it work because the scale of the flowers is so different. So as this waterfall of flowers cascades down to the bottom of the page, the loopy doopy flowers get bigger and bigger, and it's really dramatic and fun, and I love it. It almost looks like a, a floral free fall of sorts, and I dig it. Another thing about composition is just a repetition of shapes, but also bringing in shapes that are really different in curvature and style and approach. And that's what I'm doing right now with these long, skinny, almost tropical looking leaves, but not so tropical that it doesn't make sense. You get me. And they're really doing a good job of filling in the composition, giving some visual weight to areas that were starting to feel like super duper unpaid attention to, right? And the fact that I'm using a variety of greens. Every time I go to my palette to make a new leaf, I pick up a new green and it just works. And it's giving this composition a lot of beautiful, swirly direction and momentum. Paying attention to the areas that are more dry, I'm going in for sure and continuing with some super fine detail to satisfy my need to see progress right now right? <laughs> you got to see that progress. It makes us feel good. Now, keep in mind, if areas are still damp, you still might want to add some details into those damp areas. If you've been with me for a while, you know I have a middle of the road technique called wet on damp, and it's a lovely way to get soft diffusion of linear details that you add. Mm. Chef's kiss. It's the good stuff. Getting back in there, adding a few more medium sized mushroom caps. And I gotta be honest, this left hand side of the painting is getting a little awkward. And I'm so glad we're doing this choose your own adventure thing because I'm gonna be needing to resolve that. Ugh. With composition, I'm always reminding you to take a moment to breathe, stop, and evaluate, analyze. And don't do it until you feel like your brain wants to explode because that's no fun. Don't overdo it. Essentially is what I'm saying, friends. But we have to take time to take a look, see what's working, see what's not working, and see what's teetering on the precipice of not working. <laughs> oh my gosh, did that make sense? Did I just say precipice? Wow, but you get where I'm going with this. Now, if you're curious about the ways that I'm going to show you to finish these paintings, I'm gonna get a little cray cray with the materials, a little mixed media, a little basic, and yeah, yeah, you remember a little psychedelic. Anywho, friends, we're wrapping this portion of the painting up, but don't be afraid to add a real good push of linear detail. I'm using my liner brush at this point and getting into it good, all right? Linear detail at this point is super fun. It's a great way to unify the composition as it stands now, albeit admittedly very unfinished. All right, friends. How excited are we? Let's get into comments right now. Of course, after you give this a boop and let's make some predictions on what I'm going to be using in the next steps. Like what supplies do you think I'm gonna finish this painting with? I'm so curious. First up, a watercolor marker finish. And you probably could have guessed this one. I had to bring in the watercolor marker, but friends, the secret is I'm only using one color. All right, so here's the technique. It's pretty straightforward and it's gonna give you a faster finish. So if you're getting to the end of a painting and you're just feeling like I'm kind of over this, but I still love it, this is the option for you. So basically you're going to take the marker and you're gonna think about the little in-between spaces, the negative space, right? So you're going to add a few dabs of marker in the negative space along the edge of say, blue capped mushroom like here, and then a clean brush filled with water and you're gonna blendy blend out 
to fill in the negative space surrounding the mark you just laid down. Now here's the kicker. You wanna keep a wet edge. And what does that mean? Basically, if you're filling in a really big negative space area, which we don't really have too many of those on this particular painting, but if you have them on yours, your negative space areas, your background areas are big, you're gonna to wanna to work fast, broader strokes, more water, and keep that edge that's wet moving until you've filled in the entire shape. Otherwise, you're gonna get weird blooms and you're not gonna get that beautiful, soft transition from dark to light. All right, friends, this is so fun. Now I'm gonna speed this up a little bit because literally it's the same technique over and over and over again. But the thing about this one, I want you to really dig into as you decide which way to go with your painting this one is incredibly cathartic because of the repetition. You're going to feel relaxed, you're gonna feel renewed, and once you do fill the first couple of shapes and really feel confident in this technique, the rest of the painting is just like a big, beautiful breathing exercise where you feel completely calm afterward. Something to keep in mind, especially with a painting like this that has a lot of like smaller, background areas to fill in. You just want to keep an eye on where your darkness areas are versus your light. So for example, if you're filling an area and you've got dark on the top and light on the bottom of that little section of background, but that then visually bumps up to another section, you want to figure out where your dark should start in the new section and where your light should start because otherwise it's not going to look like a nice smooth transition from dark to light across the entire background. Does that make sense? It's going to look kind of patchy and all over the place and a little disorganized, I guess is the best way to say it. So keep an eye on the flow of your darks to lights across the different sections as you work. I do love to keep a white margin in certain areas, not all. Usually in the real dark contrasty areas, I like to leave a little, little thread of white in between the background and the foreground subject matter. It just adds a visual pump, ups the contrast factor. It's just a thing I do that I love. You don't have to do it. You could start to think about adding a little texture to the background as you go. So it doesn't all have to be perfectly lovely and smooth in the bigger areas to add interest. Use your marker, use lots of pressure, make some dots and dashes and squiggles and scratchy marks. Blend out some of the areas, but leave others kind of textury and rough. And that creates a really exciting just differentiation of textures in your background and keeps the painting feeling really alive and dynamic. You might be wondering at this point, okay, Christy, well, you're gonna go in with that liner brush and add detail everywhere to quote, finish the piece. I wanna flip the switch on your thinking about finish here. And this ties into composition because finishing a painting doesn't mean adding the same level of detail all over the place. It just doesn't, that's boring actually and overwhelming. So no friends, I'm not going to go in and add the same level of detail, all those little skinny directional lines everywhere. I'm gonna leave some things simplified. I'm gonna leave some things to the imagination for the mind to fill in as we view this painting. And the painting will be better for it. Now remember, we have two more options to go here. I'm gonna finish this painting in two different ways coming up. I'm curious, do you think this is the version for you or do you think your version is still to come? Let me know in the comments and of course, give a boop. Wrapping this up, friends, take a moment, take a breath, take a look and see what areas need a little more work with that light to dark transition and consistency over the entire piece, where you'd like to add some texture into your background, some little dots and scratchy moments. Just step back and have a looky-loo. I think you could have guessed it, a pencil. And now what pencil to choose, friends? You've got mechanical pencils. I've got my HB, which is my favorite. And uh, how do you know what to choose? So with this one, I wanna go bold and I want a softer lead that I can blendy blend with. So definitely using a not perfectly sharpened HB pencil. That's going to give me all of the characteristics that I'm after. And I'm approaching this from a similar point of view of kind of 
filling in the background in interesting ways that makes everything else pop, combined with adding some linear detail over top of the existing mushrooms, etc. Same kind of approach applies here, different medium, but adding little squiggles, little, little dots, little dashes, little all the things to make texture in the background softly can be really lovely way to add interest here. I'm also adding in these little shadowy mushroom shapes this I'm really excited about because this adds a sense of mystery. So we're using pencils, so the color is gray essentially, but we've got this kind of misty in the distance, what's going on, an additional mushroom patch kind of vibe going on. Wow, that was a word salad. Oh my gosh, but you know what I mean. So I think I'm gonna really push these silhouettes of additional mushrooms and flowers as I go throughout this piece. Just a thought about making decisions with a painting, where to go next with it. If your original painting is teetering on the edge of feeling really heavy and bold and maybe slightly overworked, for example, just a scenario. Choose a second medium that's going to counterbalance all of that heaviness and overworkedness, right? So a really thin mechanical pencil adding in wispy details could do just that. What I love about an HB pencil, it's kind of the middle of the road in terms of softness of the lead. H pencils are harder, B pencils are softer. And so HB is right there in the middle, but with a soft hand and a light touch, I can get the most beautiful gradients of value and shadow, which is what I'm doing here, filling in some of these silhouettes, filling in some of the background areas. And then of course, super lovely smudges happen. And I don't have a blending stump if you don't know what one of them are. Well, let's, gosh, that's a weird name. Let's just leave that for another video. But basically I'm using my finger lightly to blend and soften and smudge some of these pencil lines. And I am a sucker for that technique. It's so lovely. Just know a blending stump does the blending for you without adding the oils from your hands to the paper. So if you don't have one and you are using your finger, tread lightly, cause yeah. Getting into adding some really bold, thick lines of detail over top of the original illustration, which I think is a lovely balance of all the different uh, techniques that I've got going on here and results that I've got going on here. I've got the silhouettes in pencil. I've got the smoky, misty, smudgy background in pencil. And I've got now definition of shape over top of the watercolor in pencil. It's a really nice trio. So the same rules of composition apply when you are adding a layer of mixed media. So a variety of scale and detail and direction are things you want to keep thinking about. Here is a perfect example of really pushing scale. I'm adding in these simple, linear little filler moments. It's just a few scratchy lines, branchy lines with little ovals on the end. Some of the ovals are filled in with a shadowy pencil and some are left blank. And popping these in in all different places is such a cool way to add really, really fine detail, all the while keeping it super whimsical. Love it. All right. Friends, let me know in comments, is this your favorite one so far? I'm curious, this one's pretty fun. And now that bottom left-hand corner, if you couldn't have guessed it, friends, that, that corner was freaking me out. I didn't know what to do with it. But I did decide to bring in a rule of composition, repetition, so I'm creating a pencil version cluster of those tall skinny capped mushrooms that are on the left hand side a smaller cluster to keep things interesting i don't want to create the same size cluster and of course just the fact that they're in pencil and not in full watercolor makes this a really interesting choice i'm really pleased with this decision and wrapping this one up to give it a little bit of kind of a framed effect, I'm thinking about the outer edge of the painting, adding some big kind of tall tropical looking, maybe tulip like leaves and some more of those small filler moments that I mentioned before to just kind of button this beauty up. Okay, I gave you a teaser and this is the one I'm most excited about. So I'm so glad you're still with me friends. And if you are, give me a boop on this video and say, hey, hey, 
in the comments. Okay, psychedelic, baby. I'm going all in with the fluorescence and please don't panic about light fastness, okay? It's just not the time or place. Anywho, I started with my Kramer pigment, which I was actually really excited about, but oh man, those colors didn't want to re-wet like I'd hoped. So I brought in my Case for Making Handmade Watercolor palette that has some of my absolute favorite fluorescence on it. And basically, friends, I am attacking this in very much a similar way that I did to option number one with that watercolor marker. And I'm filling in the background first and let me tell you what what i'm going all in with the crazy town fluorescent so just 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 stick with me and then we're going to add another layer of lovely detail on top and by the end the way we finish this one with all watercolor i think is gonna be a little shocking but definitely coolio starting with yellow really getting in there blendy blend around my mushroom caps i am using the half inch dagger the tip of it it's so versatile even though it's a big brush you can really get into those nooks and crannies easily and you'll see as i go i'm starting to transition from the fluorescent yellow to the orange and then ultimately to the pink and just like I was keeping an eye on where my darks and lights started so that I could get a nice smooth background transition effect, I'm doing the same thing here with the color though because I'm not, I'm not really seeing a change in value with my fluorescent colors, but I am using a change of color from yellow to orange to pink. Now getting into the nooks and crannies around those smaller moments, those wispy waterfall of flowers can feel really tedious. If the half inch dagger is feeling too overwhelming for you, go down to the cat's tongue, go if you don't have any of these brushes, go to like a number two round and you're gonna feel like you have a lot more control. You're just gonna need to use a lot more water on your brush if you're using a smaller brush and you're gonna have to work a little quicker. Starting to transition into the pink here where I go from orange to pink. And I'm just trying to make sure that as I work in each section that that transition feels natural and smooth. And the best way to evaluate that is just every minute or so take a step back and be like, okay, yeah, I feel like I need a little bit more orange in my pink here, a little bit more pink in my orange here, if you know what I mean. And you're going to create that nice, smooth transition. All right, friends, you want to let this layer dry completely. If you're painting along with me, yeah, just let this layer dry. And while we're here, let's talk about this. And you're probably thinking, Christy, what did you do? Paint that original painting three times? Are you insane? No, it's not what I did. I actually scanned the original at the point where I stopped, right? And then I printed that original onto a high cotton content paper. It wasn't the thickest paper and it wasn't 100% cotton, but it worked. And it was just a great option for this particular exercise. And honestly, I'd recommend you doing the same. There's a paper called Kaleida and it comes in eight and a half by 11 sheets. I'm going to try to find a link for you. We use it in our invitation business, but it's fantastic for watercolor and it's great for practice. So I'm going to try to find a link for you below. So while it made it difficult for me to paint over top of the printed color because, you know, it was toner and it resists water, it was really easy for me to go in the background and add all the personality there. Is she bright enough for you? Oh my gosh. Friends, I really hope you're still with me. And even if fluorescents aren't your jam, you got to give me credit for going all in on this bad boy. So I'm diving right in with my liner brush and one color of fluorescent. This is by design. This is a great way to stretch yourself. Choose one color and one brush and finish your painting with just that. I love this approach. I'm going into the big, scary open area at the bottom left, and I am just having fun with some leafy, viney doodles. And I'm just gonna keep going. I'm gonna think about scale. I'm going to think about interest. I'm gonna vary the shapes of my leaves, some longer, some shorter, some more squat. I'm gonna create a lot of beautiful, wispy, lyrical lines. And I am in love.
Continuing on here to add these bright details to some of the little circles on this toadstool. And friends, this is kind of the approach I'm taking at this point, adding in the linear sketchy details into the background and then choosing a few select areas on the old, old? the original watercolor painting to pump up the volume a little bit. And since this is the original, this is on watercolor paper, so I can do whatever I want. Coming at this from a little bit more of like a surface pattern design approach, I'm thinking about this whole composition is more of a pattern. So think about overlapping, taking some of those vines and taking them right over top of another element. It's good stuff. Now, if you're using a liner brush and you're like, Christy, I don't get how you're getting such smooth, consistent lines. Let me tell you this. With a liner brush, it's all about loading the perfect amount of water to pigment. And it's a little bit more water than pigment. And you don't want to load it up too much. You're going to get that little bubble on the end of your brush and it's not going to give you that thin line that you're after. So it does take a little bit of practice and you might want to just hash it out on a little sheet of watercolor paper off to the side before you come onto your actual painting. With this type of approach, I'm also very much decidedly hopping around the page, adding these moments and details here and there and everywhere. Well, not really everywhere. I don't want to overwhelm any one section in the painting with any one particular kind of detailing. So you'll notice me hopping around from adding the vines with the liner brush to adding bigger fill in areas on the caps of the mushrooms to here adding some stripes on these skinny capped mushrooms. And I'll be honest, because the background is so bold and bright and crazy and over the top, I'm going to pull back a little bit with these final details and not go crazy town on them. Now, the last little detail that I added is one of my favorites, and it basically looks like a fluorescent seeded eucalyptus moment. Oh my gosh, just Google seeded eucalyptus. You'll see what I mean. So fun. Just little scratchy branchy marks with your liner brush with little circles, dots of color on the end. So good. Okay, friends, this has been such a blast, but I want to hear in comments, which version is the winner? Which one and why? So number one is the washi dreamy watercolor marker background. Number two is the fun and sketchy pencil. And number three, the psychedelic fluorescent craziness. So which one is your favorite? One, two, or three? Let's get the conversation going in comments. And now friends, if you want to dive deeper into my washy weird watercolor technique and really the basis of everything that I did here today, figure out how I use color on the page, you can't miss this video. Go ahead and watch it. Happy painting, friends. Mm -hmm.